Right, that's Nick Webb, crime scene reconstructionist. Want to bring on uh, Charlie Wilkie, former police officer, to understand this crime scene. I got to get your perspective on this, and I'm so happy we have you on here. What strikes you as strange, if anything, about this shooting? Um, uh, Officer Oliver's actions are being scrutinized under a microscope. Is there something that stands out to you? Well, a couple of things stand out. One was the original testimony saying that the car was backing up at the time. So initially, we're thinking that this is in defense of his fellow officer. And then that was later disputed by physical evidence and by the officer's own testimony. And then the other thing that really stood out to me is the fact that, that when, he, when he decided to take this action, when he decided that there was imminent danger and, and he did take the, the stance of, of firing his rifle multiple times into the vehicle, it wasn't, as, as the testimony we just heard, it wasn't as if he had a clear shot at who he believed to be the suspect of an ag assault with a motor vehicle or attempted murder of the officer, i.e. the driver. There was obviously the passenger in between, which is our victim in this case, uh, who, who sustained the, the, the injuries. Um, so, you know, you're responsible for when you decide to pull that trigger, where that, where that bullet goes, uh, you know, and, and you have to know that uh, what you're trying to eliminate is, is definitely in a clear path. Uh, you, you can't shoot through other people to try to eliminate that, and, and that seemed to be the case in this matter, that uh, maybe there, there was a, a poor judgment in, in choosing that uh, time to discharge a weapon in that manner with, with, with what he saw you know, as, as his vision. If we take a step back, the reason they went running out is they heard gunshots. They heard gunshots from a nearby uh, rehabilitation center, a nursing home. They didn't know where those gunshots were coming from. They thought maybe it probably came from the car. So what's strange to me is why did he go back to get his rifle? Doesn't he have his service weapon on him? Right. You know, he should have his weapon on him. And, and how much time is there involved in between going to, to arm yourself with a rifle uh, as, as opposed to going out and trying to intervene in case there are innocent people being being shot at. Uh, I, I didn't quite understand that, but I didn't know the path in which he was running either. Was it on the way? How easily is the rifle accessible in the vehicle? A lot of those questions, you know, I don't really have the answers to, but it seemed like it, 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 he did divert uh, from, from the path of, of his concern to, uh, to arm himself with another weapon. Let's picture the crime, that scene. So everybody's leaving this party. Everybody's dispersing. People are getting in their cars, going away. They hear the gunshots. Why did they think that car had something to do with the gunshots? I'm confused. I've watched this body cam footage. I don't know why they immediately went to that car and why Officer Gross decided to take his, uh, uh, try to break the, the back windshield and have the car stop. What, what directed them to that car? I'm not sure about that either. I didn't know if there was any other testimony that, that led to that, that they thought that someone pointed that car out as being involved, but obviously there wasn't any physical evidence of it. I think there was some earlier testimony of the fact that the, the reason that they even backed up is because their path was blocked. It wasn't that it was an evasive movement. It was just a pure matter that they were just backing up. And, and in a sense, they were doing exactly what the officers had told them to do. They were dispersing. They had been told to leave the party. They were making everybody leave. So I'm sure they weren't the only vehicle that was probably leaving at that time. I could right. imagine that they were the only one. It's confusing. It's really it's just confusing and trying to understand yeah. why this 15-year-old young man got killed. I don't quite understand it myself. Absolutely. But the jury's going to have to figure that out. Now, I want to go back into the courtroom if we can. Uh, this, again, is a very interesting back and forth with this crime scene reconstructionist before the jury is called in. So let's go live and we can listen a little more. Yosha, I need you to break this down for me because I'm not a smart guy. I need you to help me out. What is going on before the jury's called in? What are these motions? Why do they have these witnesses coming on? What's the purpose of it? So in every trial, there's a lot of things that happen outside the view of the jury. They're trying to decide, um, are certain witnesses expert witnesses? Can they testify? Can certain information about, for example, Officer Oliver and, and what he had done in the past and prior bad acts, can those come in? And in order to not taint or prejudice the jury, they have to be done just with the judge and the defense and prosecution. It's interesting. This is a trial. This is how it goes on. We cover it here in real time on Law and Crime. But before we go back into the courtroom, again, the jury's not present, I want to show you the body cam footage right now. This is of Officer Gross. This shows the whole shooting, how everything went down. Let's show it. Hey, uh, hamburger, come here. Have a seat. Where are you at school? Westbrook. All these Westbrook Sea kids? 
Maybe. Wow, well, Southern whiskey, pretty much all the same. <laughs> Let's see. Don't do this again. Yeah, this is a one time thing, sir. Mr. Rhodes, I'm Officer Gross, okay? Officer Gross. I don't, I don't want to see this again. Yeah, okay, let's see this again. I expected to get this. I don't. I... I get it. It's impossible if you're an officer or someone in that situation what to do. But I want to bring back on Charlie Wilkie, former police officer, to talk about what you're supposed to do. So just help us out here, Charlie. You hear gunshots. You're on a crime scene. What do you do if you're an officer? Well, you know, your first responsibility is to make sure that you're safeguarding lives and property. So you're out there. You're trying to make sure that anyone's a potential suspect or potential victim is stopped. And, uh, you know, there was more than one car, obviously, we saw in that video that was that was addressed by Officer Gross. He had one vehicle to his left, and then the other vehicle that ultimately was shot into was back to his right. But it didn't appear, you know, looking at the video at all, that the car was ever close to him at all. And, and we didn't know what, you know, or they would not know at that time where the suspects were, if they were inside the car or not. So they're trying to secure the scene, trying to make sure everybody that's there stays there. But at the same time, you've got people who've already been ordered to leave, trying to leave, and then gunfire erupts, and uh, and so it, it turns into chaos. Nobody in that car was firing a weapon, okay? No. How are you supposed to stop the car? Is this a stupid question? Are you supposed to shoot out the tires? Like, why did he no. shoot right in there? What are you supposed to do? If you think that car has something to do with the shooting, even though there was no gunfire coming from it, what are you supposed to do to stop the car? No, you really can't. The only thing you can do at that point is get a get a good description of the car, hopefully get a tag number and for follow up later on. If you happen to have an air unit in the area that could follow the car as it left out of that 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 scene, possibly maybe. But but shooting the tires or anything like that was was definitely nothing that would be called upon at that time. It wasn't like this was a high speed pursuit right. that was coming yeah. into town. And, you were trying and I to wish they did vehicle. that. I wish they did that. Just called in the number. We wouldn't have to be here covering this. We'll take right. a quick break. We'll come back with more Roy Oliver. Okay, welcome back, everybody. So a gunshot residue uh, expert is on the stand. The jury is not present this morning because they're determining what the judge will allow from these expert witnesses when they ultimately testify in front of the jury. I want to bring back in uh, Charlie Wilkie because, uh, Charlie, my question is the gunshot residue here, right? What, what is the importance of this analysis in trying to understand how the, the, sh the shooting happened? What are we trying to understand from such an expert? Well, I think a big part of it is is it's uh, given uh, testing out that the young men in the car to determine that they never were involved in, in firing a weapon uh, because there could have been a defense where they were saying that, the, you know, they fired a weapon and maybe it got tossed and was not recovered or something of that matter. But when we test all three of them and if it comes back negative, then obviously you're proving that obviously they were not involved in any type of discharging of a weapon. Right. And that is an important key because I keep saying that these guys had nothing to do with the shooting that we heard. Um, so, Charlie, stand by. We'll get more uh, from your analysis in a minute after our break. But I want to ask Yosha a quick question. Uh, Yosha, my question to you is, the defense, this is a very hard case for them. Do they put 
the defendant on the stand, which is what we've seen a lot in self-defense cases. I think it would actually be very powerful here and somewhat necessary. I think it's much more likely for a Texas jury not to convict the officer if he's able to testify that he was in fear for his life, he was in fear for his partner's life, which is why he discharged his, his Weapon. Easier said than done. We've seen that happen before and it has not always been successful, but we've also covered these officer-related shootings before, and sometimes you get a mistrial. Juries are split one way down the, 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 down the middle, and you don't even get a verdict one way or another. So we don't know which way this is going to go. We'll take a quick break on our end, but when we come back, we are going back live into the Roy Oliver case. Stay tuned. Hey there, everybody. We are back right now live in the Roy Oliver case out of Texas, a police officer who is on trial for the murder of a 15-year-old young man named Jordan Edwards. And we're trying to understand why this happened. We know that Edwards, along with a bunch of kids, were at a house party. The house party got broken up by Officer Oliver and Officer Gross. Um, all of a sudden, while they're in the house trying to understand, you know, what how this house party went down, they hear 12 to 15 gunshots from a nearby nursing home. The officers rush out. Edwards is in the car with his brothers. They're driving away. They're asked by Officer Gross, who's Officer Oliver's partner, to stop the car. They don't do so. Officer Gross tries to stop the car. And then without breaking a minute, without breaking a stride, this man, the defendant, opens fire into that car with his rifle ultimately killing Jordan Edwards. And what we are going to potentially learn is that no one in that car had any weapons. They were not the ones who fired those shots. So why was he killed? Why was Jordan Edwards killed? What we first thought was that, um, that Mr. Oliver believed that there was a danger to his partner, that the, he believed the car was backing up and going to hit his partner. Although when you look at the body cam footage, really didn't appear that way. So let's go back live into court. This is the ju the jury is not present right now. Oh, they're switching witnesses right now. A lot of times they have these witnesses on before the jury comes in. And let me ask Yosha Gunasakara about that real quick. Yosha, why do they have these witnesses on in order to limit their testimony when they actually are in front of the jury? What does it matter? Well, the judge doesn't want the jury to be tainted. So, for example, if that, if one of the expert witnesses says X, Y, and Z, but the judge only wants them to hear Y and Z, they've already heard X. So it's basically just not to prejudice the jury. Interesting. And, Charlie, I have a question for you. It's tough being an officer, really tough being an officer. Do, is there anything that when you look at the video you said, you know what, I can understand what was going on in the mind of, of Officer Oliver, hearing the gunshots, um, a car wouldn't stop when being asked to stop. Is there anything, although the flip side of it is they are trained for these various scenarios. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's supposed to be the defining moment between us and, and the people who are not trained to handle those type of situations. Um, I, I can see I can see the volatility of the scene. I can see the chaos. You know, it's, it's a very fluid scene. Everything's going on at, you know, 90 miles an hour. However, coming short of, of, of pulling that trigger, um, you have to justify that. And, and, and I, you know, like the rest of us, uh, uh, just having a hard time seeing it. Maybe there's there's more to it and the, we'll find out in the trial. But uh, in looking at it from the from the from the body cam from Officer Gross, I just don't see what what would give uh, a good stance to justify taking that taking that stance. I just don't yet. And it's important that we have this trial and this discussion because you don't want just everybody firing their weapons whenever they see some sort of danger. This is not what should have happened. That is very clear. By all accounts, Jordan Edwards was a great young man who was going to go places in his life, but he was taken way too soon. Before Absolutely. we go back live into that courtroom, I think they've turned the camera off because something's happening in the courtroom. We'll update you as soon as we know more. I want to play the testimony from yesterday of Grant Fredericks. He's a video analyst. He is somebody who dissected that uh, body cam footage. Let's learn a little bit more about it. Okay, that was Grant Fredericks analyzing the body cam footage. I want to talk to Charlie Wilkie more about this because, Charlie, one of the most bizarre things for me, and again, not an officer, don't know how it works, but my question to you is, is it a bit strange that Officer Gross, the partner of Roy Oliver, tried to break the windshield? That that was his first attempt to try to start stop the car. No, not not exactly. I, I mean, he's he's uh, engaging them, you know, to try to make sure that they know that it's, it's his their vehicle that he's addressing to tell them to stop. And then he he takes physical action to try to make sure that they understand that. Listen, I, I want you to stop. I, I I don't know that I've ever broken a window in that manner, but I'm not saying it's 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 that far fetched. 
Um, I think he was he was getting his point across that he definitely did not want them to leave the scene at the time until they could investigate to see if they were involved in the shooting or not. Right. And Yosha, my question is, with speaking of Officer Gross, does it matter what was going on in his mind from a legal point of view? If he said, I felt no fear, I didn't think my life was in danger, but Officer Oliver felt differently, how does that work? I think it is significant, especially in the jurors' minds. Again, Officer Oliver was saying that he was concerned for Officer Gross's safety, and I think it's a huge blow to the defense's case when Officer Gross says, look, I just wasn't in fear of my life. So I think it damages uh, the defense very strongly. Interesting. Well, let's learn a little bit more what the defense was able to do by cross-examining this witness because they didn't like what he had to say. Take a look. There is some pretty interesting testimony from yesterday, and I want to get the perspective of Charlie again. Charlie, is there any validity to the argument that, hey, listen, you know, we partners, when Officer Oliver, Officer Gross, he, Officer Gross took out his firearm, uh, probably thought there was a danger there on uh, Officer Oliver's perspective. Maybe he was justified in taking out his rifle and felt that there was a, a real threat and that partners have these cues to one another. What do you think about that? Oh, I agree. We're, we're all going to, uh, you know, shots have been fired. There's no doubt that there was a need to, to arm themselves. And that means having the, the gun in their hand, not not having it still holstered. Um, but but that's where it stops. I mean, at that point on, you have to address whatever threat you have or don't have. And Officer Gross testified that he never felt that he was, he was in imminent danger. And Officer Oliver, of course, obviously is going to, if he does testify, give it give a different uh, opinion on that based upon what he perceived. Uh, there's nothing wrong with arm yourself, nothing wrong with the fact that Officer Oliver went and retained his uh, his rifle from the car. He's, he's more accurate at a longer distance. It's better for officer safety standpoint to, to have a rifle than it is to have a, 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 a handgun. However, it still comes down to are you justified in pulling that trigger? That becomes the question, and that's the one we're going to ultimately see how the jury rules. Uh, listen, Charlie, thank you so much for coming on. We loved having your perspective on multiple cases here today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to take a break on our end. But when we come back, we have a lot to discuss. Oliver, Hubers, Tibbetts, Manafort. You're not going to want to mess anything here on Law and Crime. Okay, not a whole lot going on in the courtroom right now. Their jury is not present. They're analyzing these witnesses. The judge will determine what portions of their testimony will be permitted uh, when they ultimately do testify in front of the jury. We want to bring back in long crime trial analyst Yosha Gunasekera to get into more of the meat of this case. From the witnesses that we actually have heard in front of the jury, they're all supporting the theory that there was no legitimate threat against Officer Gross and Officer Oliver merely took matters into his own hands and fired that weapon. Do they need witnesses to support Oliver's theory, or does it only matter what's in his mind, what he was feeling? Well, what really determines this case is what a reasonable person in Officer Oliver's situation would do, so what a reasonable police officer would do. And so what really helps determine what that means is the testimony from everyone around there. So if everyone is saying this is ridiculous, the car was moving away, that helps us understand that reasonable person standard. But there's a possibility if he gets on the stand and says, this is why I had a legitimate fear for my partner's life, he could be acquitted. Sure, it definitely is. In Texas, we don't see a lot of officers being convicted for these type of cases. So it would definitely, a conviction in this case would be going against the grain of what we have been seeing. We're going to talk more about that when we get back from our break because there's been a lot of cases that we've covered here on Law and Crime. Some of them mistrials. The jury split one way down the, the middle about an officer-related shooting. So we'll talk more about that when we get back. We'll take a quick break. Stay tuned. Again, just picking on those pieces of her testimony, what will she be allowed to say to the jury? This is all very preliminary, but let's talk more about the meat of this case right now with Yosha Gunasekera. So, Yosha, we talked about before our last break, we've seen a lot of officer-related cases where they are the defendants in these shootings where you see mistrials. Juries are split down the middle. Why does that happen? I think juries understand that oftentimes police officers are putting themselves in danger. They're putting themselves in the line of fire. And you see uh, a group of jurors 
understanding that and saying that they couldn't convict a police officer who was trying to look out for themselves or the safety of another officer. And then you see another group of jurors who say, look, we can't acquit him or we can't acquit the police officer because they should know better. They discharged their arm or did something to cause the death of somebody else. So you really do see these two factions, and oftentimes it's a difficult case to prove, especially in a place like Texas, where a police officer, from my understanding, has never done time or jail time for a case like this. Okay, if it was in any other person, right, you hear gunshots, you run out, you see a car driving away, you tell that car to stop, it doesn't stop, it's speeding away, you could say, okay, maybe there's a danger here. These officers, though, when we talked about with Charlie Wilkie before, they're trained for this very situation. What was the threat that he legitimately saw here? Because if you look at the body cam footage, the car is going in the opposite direction. No one in the car was firing any weapons. The only thing that they seemed to have done was not obey Officer Gross's command to stop the car. Exactly. And we heard Officer Wilkie say there really is no recourse to be able to stop the car. If the car is driving away, you can't pull out your gun and fire at the tires. You just have to take a description of the car and try to investigate later. So there really wasn't a threat here. And I, and I think that's why the prosecutors decided to move forward on this case and charge the officer. Can he be found guilty of something less in the sense, look, I didn't intend to kill anybody in the car. I just fired my weapon hoping to stop the car and ultimately resent it, it uh, ended up in this tragedy. Is there any value to that argument? Yes, they could. They uh, The jury could convict him on something called a lesser included, which is just uh, the same type of case and crime, but it's the culpability, the intent isn't there. So that's definitely a possibility in this case. And if he takes the stand, chances he'll be acquitted. It's hard to say. It really depends on how his testimony is going to play out. He could, you know, shoot himself in the foot or he could, you know, really impress the jurors and show them that he was in danger. Yosha Gunasakara, thank you so much for coming on. I loved having your perspective this morning. It was great to be here. Thank you. Of course. All right, everybody, we're going to take a break on our end. When we come back, a lot more to discuss. Oliver, Huber's, Manafort, Tibbetts. Stay tuned here on Law and Crime.